In the last video, we left off asking when do vector fields acting on functions, when do their um, operations commute if you have more than one vector field? And we'll present a theorem and we'll give an outline and sketch of its proof that tells us a sufficient condition for when derivatives acting on functions commute, provided that they exist. So we first consider a subset an open subset of Rn, and a function defined on A, and let's say a point C in A, and a function defined on A. That's um, satisfying the following conditions. So first we assume that uh, all of the ordinary derivatives of the function make sense. So the first, um, so any partial derivative, let's say, sorry, let's say the do codomain of the function um, is Rm, uh, so that it's more general. Uh, let's say all the partials exist um, on some open set u containing c, on some open subset u of a uh, containing c, to the second order partial derivatives exist let's say we have the same subset u and third, and di dj f um, is continuous at c. For all i and j, then it turns out that the partial derivatives acting on the function commute. at the point C. And this actually makes sense if we only assume not for all i and j, but some arbitrarily chosen i and j, some fixed i and j. And so what we'll do is we'll give a sketch of the proof So how could we even attempt at proving something like this? What we should do is we should look at the definitions of the partial derivatives. And it helps because um, it's not really much more of a generalization to consider arbitrary i and j. It helps just to focus on a single function of two variables for simplicity. So assume set n equals to 2, and we'll just look at the partial derivatives in the first and second directions. And this is absolutely no, there's no loss of generality here because all we're really doing is for any two variables that we have, what we're doing is we're fixing one and fixing all of them and then seeing how the function changes with respect to one. And then we're fixing all of the other ones and then we're varying this leftover um, variable as well. And only two variables are changing throughout this entire procedure. So it suffices to consider a function of just two variables. And again, m equals 1 is for simplicity. I'll let you think about what happens when m is uh, greater than 1. So let's look at the first partial derivative. Let's just consider the expression um, of taking the partial derivative in the, let's say, first direction and then taking the partial derivative at the um, second direction. So let's see equal a, b. So we have some point a, b, and we're going to look at what the value is. So first, we're going to take, here we're going to take the second derivative. So I'll just rewrite this as I'm going to take the second derivative of a function. And that function is going to be the partial derivative of f in the first direction. And then I'll evaluate that it's at a, b. 
So let's write out what taking the second partial derivative does on this function. So by definition, this gives the limit as k approaches 0 of the function partial 1f evaluated at here we're taking the derivative with respect to the second variable so the first variable is fixed so we have a comma b plus k minus this function right call it g if it helps so that you don't confuse yourself which partial derivative uh, we're applying at a comma b and then we're dividing this all by k and now, now that we have this expression, now let's unpack what it means to take this partial derivative here and here. So when we do that, by definition, this is the limit as this stays the same. Let's even pull out the 1 over k factor. So we have limit as k approaches 0, 1 over k. And let's take the definition of the derivative here. So this says the limit as h approaches 0. So applying the first definition, we get f of a plus h, and then we leave the second variable fixed, that's b plus k, minus f of a, and then again we leave the second variable fixed, that's b plus k, all divided by h. That's the first expression corresponding to this, underneath this um, term right here. And then we subtract the second, and we also apply the derivative, the definition of the derivative, and we get f of a plus h, leave the second component fixed, minus f of a, b, all over h. And now we can distribute out the limits, but being careful to keep, to preserve the order that we have them in, and, um, and when we do that, we get the limit as k approaches 0, limit as h approaches 0, of 1 over h times k times a function. And what is that function? It's the sum and difference of just four terms. And these four terms are f of a plus h, b plus k, minus f of a, b plus k, minus f of a plus h b plus, because of this minus sign, f of a b. Now, this is the definition of first applying the first partial derivative and then applying the second. If we did it in the other order, the only thing that would change is the order in which these limits are taken. So if we define this expression, um, let's call this lambda hk, then the goal of the theorem is to prove that the limit as k goes to 0, limit as h goes to 0, of this function lambda hk over hk is equal to let me now erase this because it's a little bit in our way. This was lambda hk is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 and then k in the other order of the same exact function. This is our goal. And the idea behind how to prove something like this turns out again to use the mean value theorem. And how does it exactly do that? Well, if we look at this expression for lambda hk, this will be a lemma, there exist p and q, and not only are these points in our domain, but they happen to be in the rectangle obtained from starting at our point c, a comma b, and then expanding out in the direction 
in the first direction by h and in the second direction by k. So these can be found in the rectangle obtained from h and k uh, with center or with one of its corners at c. Uh, so there exist points p and q uh, sufficiently close to c such that lambda hk is equal to the derivative of this function at these points p and q times hk and similarly for the other way around and equals d1 d2f at q times hk. So we have is an expression for lambda in two different ways that involve the two different partial derivatives that we're looking at. At points in which the derivatives make sense because we assume that these partial derivatives exist on some open set and when we make this uh, limiting definition, when we look at this limit definition we're looking at when h and k approach to zero. So there exist h and k sufficiently small so that they're near the point c. And so it makes sense to look at this expression. And the mean value theorem is used in proving the existence of such a p and a q. When we have this, we can then consider the special case of setting h and k to be the same quantity let's say t. And when we move this, uh, when we move that t squared over to both sides, what we'll have is two different but equal expressions for these two different partial derivatives. But remember that these partial derivatives are at specific points p and q that depend on this choice of h and k. So, it, it follows from this lemma that if I replace h and k by some arbitrary t, we can use the lemma to prove over and over again for every single value of t that there exists a point pt and qt uh, inside this rectangle of uh, length, side lengths t with one of its corners at c. And when we take, oh, and we have to multiply this by t squared, right? That's what we had before here. So when we divide by t squared, what happens is we have these two identical expressions, and then applying the limit of that, because these functions are continuous at c, I know that the limits are both going to be equal. And this therefore proves that these two limits are the same. So that's the idea behind the proof. And notice that it was very crucial that we used continuity at the point C because these points, PT and QT, as, T, as this rectangle is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, these points are getting closer and closer to C. They have no choice, right? And, um, and so this, this actually concludes the proof of that theorem.